Well, you know, things have been uh, going very well. We're very excited about how the uh, campaign has progressed up to this point. Uh, we have never really slowed down or stopped since the uh, primary race. We just kept doing what we've been doing uh, for the last 16, 17 months. Uh, you know, in the summertime, we do a lot of parades and uh, going out talking to community events and community organizations and door to door and just, you know, staying pretty active, uh, engaging voters. And, you know, we're pretty excited. We've had a, a great level of uh, volunteers that continue to be a part of our campaign. Uh, donations seem to be going well. So I think we're all excited and we're, you know, looking forward to November 4th. You know, I think they're excited about the change of leadership and, and nothing against the previous administration. It's just it's been there for 20 years. And I think they're just looking forward to a, a new leader and somebody else coming in. And, you know, when we talk about the initiatives that I have for the sheriff's office, they seem to be uh, accepted fairly well or, or well. And uh, so we're excited to be able to implement those proposals. And Do they have any issues they bring up that they hope you address? Uh, the, the main one I've heard is out in the county, uh, out in the rural areas, the, uh -huh. the small villages that they don't see uh, deputies enough. Uh -huh. And that's one of the uh, initiatives that I've been talking about, the, the proposal I made about the direct patrols. And uh, that has been has gone over well. Uh, they're excited about it. I don't know if uh, uh, everybody remembers how that worked, but direct patrols basically is when we have deputies assigned to east and west county, they're very large areas. Uh, they go all the way from uh, Divernon all the way to Williamsville, and if it's east, out to Iliopolis and that whole surrounding area. And if it's uh, West County, it's out to Pleasant Plains and all that surrounding area. So they're very large. So the, the proposal is, is that we'll have uh, the, the shift lieutenants uh, and as a department break them down into smaller areas, zones per se. And so when a deputy is assigned to, let's say, West County, they can say, we want you to be in West County, but the, for the first four hours or the last four hours, wherever it may be, or whatever times that the shift supervisors thinks appropriate, we want you in zone one. So it just holds more accountability so we know that we had a deputy in this particular area d during this time. And I think that helps when the second shift supervisors come in and they see what areas the day shift people have worked, then they can assign them to the other part of the county. Now, we don't want to take total discretion away from the deputies that they can go out and patrol other areas, but I, th I think it's important that we know that they're out in these particular areas during these particular times. And it's also good for the deputies because if they don't normally get out in that area, it gives them an opportunity to be out there and patrol in the area without responding to a call for service. And how would that differ from the current practice? Uh, right now, when the deputies are assigned to East and West County, they just are assigned that area and they can patrol anywhere they want in that area. So what is the crime rate in Sangamon County and what are the um, most, is it a rising crime rate, is it decreasing, and what are the major crimes that you'll confront as sheriff? Uh, I was at the jail committee meeting last week, and Sheriff Williamson reported that the crime rate is lower again this year than it was last year. In all crimes, or just uh, particular? Not all crimes. Uh, some majority of the crimes. I don't have that sheet with me. Uh, I can get, I can actually get those numbers. Uh, it's a month. It's a monthly stat that the sheriff's office puts out. Uh -huh. And you know, the, I think the major crimes that we will continue to confront is the um, the, the drug use. Uh, drug use leads to other crimes, uh, burglaries and thefts and assaults. So, you know, uh, that's why I've always supported the DIRT team, and we will continue to keep that going. Uh, you know, the faster we can get th these individuals off the streets, the less crimes they can commit. Is that the major thing that you'll be confronting is drug use? Well, you know, there, there's all different types of crimes, but that is one of the, the major ones that leads to other crimes. What are some things you would do different um, to combat the drug resistance and all of the things sure. that the county's faced with in that regard? Well, I think you, you have two components. You have the enforcement component, uh, which is the DIRT team, and support them and continue to uh, support their efforts. And if down the road more manpower permits it, we can assign more people to that. Uh, cooperation, coordination with other agencies, and also education. Uh, trying to prevent our youth from experimenting and going to drugs in the first place. What does DIRT stand for again? Uh, drug, interdic drug Interdiction Response Team, I believe. Okay, and what, how do they do what they do? It's no, no different. It's just the acronym for our, 
division, but it's no different than the drug response team that the Springfield Police has. Uh, there's street crime, or not street crimes, they have a drug unit. So it's just an acronym that the Sheriff's Office use, but it's no different than any other agency's drug teams. Uh, which means that? Their primary focus is on the on drug use, drug users, drug abusers, and okay, getting uh, drugs off the street and getting the criminals off the street. Medical marijuana is coming, maybe even to a storefront in Springfield. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts on that, and if anything else should change over time? Well, I think we should continue our fight on drugs, uh, especially the harder drugs, the heroin, uh, which is making a major comeback, uh, cocaine, meth, and those type of drugs. Uh, I think society's uh, opinions are changing on mar marijuana and medical marijuana and coming. Uh, but as long as the laws are they are what they are, we will continue to force the laws. But I, I can see that changing in the next couple of years. Uh, um, you know, obviously, if you go certain areas, people think that it's not always the same kind of enforcement for different people or whatever. And I, you know, I can't speak to that here. But um, are you, do you think decriminalization is a good idea over time for marijuana? Uh, my only concern is is my law enforcement background that marijuana is a uh, is uh, the drug that leads to other drugs. The gateway. The gateway to drugs, <laughs> thank you. It, it can be, and you know, it, not necessarily. Uh, not everybody falls in that trap, but some young kids do. Uh, so it's a gateway to other drugs. But on the other hand, you know, uh, it is a problem for the jails, and that's why I do support the use of uh, citations or not making arrests and taking them to the jail, writing a report for the state attorney's office or like the Springfield Police does, they, for small amounts, they issue ordinance violations to keep them out of the, the jail system. So I support those type efforts. Does the county do that now? Does the county uh, board allow that too? Uh, we do not, but rarely do they, we take them to jail uh, for small amounts. We just confiscate the drug, write the report for the state attorney's office and let them handle it from there. Okay, um, so what does that mean? Is it, st is it a misdemeanor or a felony if they have a small amount? It would it would depend on the amount of, uh, of the drug so they you have. You let them go if it's a felony amount? It depends on the amount they have. Uh, if it's a felony amount, more than likely they'll be taken into custody. Okay. Yeah, it's, just it's a personal use amount. that is, And I think that's even with Springfield Police. If it's a small personal amount, I think it's less than 2.5 grams, uh, they can issue an ordinance violation. Right, but you're not allowed to do that then? Well, we don't have ordinance violations, but we're, we're not mandated arrest and meter. So we, we confiscate the drug, we write the report, we release them, write the report, and let the state attorney's office follow up. They can always issue a notice to appear to come in court, or if they fail to appear, they can issue a warrant for the arrest. Okay. Is anything needed by, does the county board need to take any action as far as you're concerned to set any, any parameters for that or rules? Uh, the, the only difference between the two systems is the ordinance violation if they do challenge it, they go in front of, of a administrative judge through the city of Springfield. They don't actually go to the courthouse. And then whatever fines are assessed, I believe, is go to the city of Springfield. Uh, right now, you know, we, if they're going to be charged, they're charged through the court system, and the fines are assessed through the courts. I'm wondering uh, what you know about where uh, meth use or meth, um, meth lab seizures. Uh, from my understanding, uh, there has not been a, a lot of arrests for meth users in the Simon County area. Uh, there's been more heroin uh, arrests and, and deaths from heroin use. Uh, one, oh, I heard on one of your advertisements that you want to bring back the DUI officer. I yes. remember the last time there was a DUI officer, it made kind of a big story because he was tasing somebody. and. It, I know it never looks good when it's on film, um, <laughs> and and he had some tremendous number of arrests. So, what is your vision for that? Where do you get the money for it, and who do you put on it? And are they just going to like stake out bars and try to catch anybody leaving, or what? Yeah. Well, uh, just last week they reinstituted the uh, DUI position, oh, they so did? there's there's somebody in that position now. Uh, <laughs> who is it? Uh, 
uh, Deputy Jason Hansen. Okay. Uh, I just found that out myself, so okay. our next ad when it comes out will be corrected. Okay, okay. Uh, Everybody's correcting ads these yeah. days. Yeah, well, it, it's, it, what, we weren't wrong when we put it out. Right. Uh, we, we didn't know they were in the process of appointing a new DUI officer. Okay. So that position is filled now. Uh, you know, I, I encourage fair enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I think Jason, uh, Deputy Hansen's a, a great deputy, and I think he'll do a good job, and he's fair and, and, and consistent. What, what does one officer do that's got that title? It right. just seems like it's an awfully big right. crowd. Well, his, his, one his pr primary responsibility is to apprehend those under the influence of alcohol. Well, so he can do it. He can do it in the city of Springfield. He can do it in the in, out in the rural areas of the county. It, uh, you know, they're going to go where the, the problems are. So does he lead a squad of people, or is it no? He he's by himself. He's supervised, uh, has a supervisor, but he's. Yeah. It's always been common to have one or two uh, DUI officers. There's, do they call? I mean, when other officers or, or uh, deputies have a case like that, do they call the DUI officer and to, like, write it up because they're the expert on, like, the, right. the street test or the... The, the, the field sobriety test. testing and, oh. and... Yes, they do. So if another deputy stops somebody that uh, appears to be impaired, they call over the DUI officer. It's not like he's the only officer out looking for DUI. He's not the only one, but that's his primary responsibility. Yeah. So... He's the expert they turn to to do the testing. Well, most, most deputies are trained to do it anyway. What the difference is, is... Right now, we have five or six deputies on, on a shift. He's an additional deputy that's out there for nothing but the enforcement of DUI patrol. Okay, but he's just one guy, so he must work right. um, yeah. seven days a week? Well, he, no, he works his regular shift, and the nights that he's off, then the deputies handle the, the, the DUI arrest themselves. Okay. How does that compare, having a DUI officer specific for that, how does that compare with arrest uh, records in communities that do not have that? Well, just the same kind alone, our DUI arrests have went down uh, since the, the elimination of the DUI officer. And one of the main reasons is is deputies are normally busy, and they don't have the time to take three or four hours off the street. Uh, so. How about DUI deaths? Uh, I, I don't know those numbers. I haven't heard of any incre increases. We don't have the we don't have the personnel to uh, dedicate commit the time to it. Yes. Uh, portable cameras remind us where you are on that issue uh, for, the, for the officers. The body cams. Yeah. Body cams, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I've been attending the jail committee meetings for several months now since I uh, got in the race for the sheriff, and they've been talking about this issue for a long time. Uh, the county's goal is is to equip all squad cars with in dash cameras first uh, we currently have 12 cars in the patrol division that have the cameras we're going to order nine more they'll be equipped with cameras so that'd be about half the fleet so another year or two we should have all the squad cars with in dash cameras i do support uh body cameras because quite honestly it, it, ke it keeps the the police officers uh it gives them an opportunity to dispute any type of allegations of uh, and then also it also uh, keeps the offenders more responsible because they know they're being filmed they're less likely to act up Does it keep the officer uh, more responsible? well I think it it, it can uh, I think the sheriff's office does a great job I don't think there's a uh, concern generalizing, but in generalizing I think the, sure the, these incidents that occur with various well, I think on both sides if they know they're being filmed they're less likely to to act up Yes. Uh, Do you foresee a, a rule of some sort that governs when they have to be on? Or and, that, and that's the process that has to be worked out. Right now, uh, there is no eavesdropping law in the state of Illinois. When the Illinois Supreme Court said the our law was unconstitutional, I, I believe we fall under the federal guidelines right at the moment. But there has been a bill that's been introduced that by the Senate that has not been passed yet. We need to find out what that is. Right now, it specifically states and allows in-car dash cameras for police officers. Uh, it does not mention body cameras, so we don't know where that's going to fall. So that needs to be worked out. The issue of when, when are the cameras 
required to be on, when they're not required to be on. Uh, that's also an issue. And then the storage. Uh, I know the, the figure has been thrown out there for $30,000. Well, that may be just the cost of equipment, but anybody that deals with data knows you got to store it somewhere. And that can be very expensive because if you start, we're a 24 hour, seven day a week operation. And then another issue with that is when somebody FOIAs uh, a particular incident, it ain't like a police report where you can just print it out, take a black marker, edit it, copy it again, and give it to the uh, person requesting the, the, the information. This has to be, somebody has to sit there, they have to be able to cut it, edit it, and, and take out the information because uh, we probably not going to be putting out people's names, date of birth, addresses, and those type of informations. And then uh, in the area of when to use it, when not to use it, what if you're the person's a victim of a crime? Are they going to be required to have it on if they're just taking a burglary report? So those are all the issues that need to be worked out. So I think that's why the time of we're at least working on getting all the squad cars equipped with them, and I think that gives us time to work through these other issues. So you're getting the We have not ordered any, any uh, body cameras yet. I'm talking about in, in the car dash cameras, which is already permitted by law, and they have been. Um, when your opponent, Mr. Uh, Regan, one of the things he said is there should also be body cameras on correctional officers, jailers. Do you agree mm -hmm. with that? Well, right now we have over 150 uh, cameras in the jail, and again, it comes down to cost. Uh, I don't, I don't, I believe that our correctional officers do a very good job. I know they work hard and I'm not opposed to it. I'm mean, it's, it's no different than on the patrol side of it. I'm, I, I'm in favor of it, just the cost of doing it and working out all these other issues. Remind me, uh, you said, and I just missed the number of cars in the fleet. Well, we have about 40 cars, 40 to 45 cars in the fleet. And of those 20 some will have cameras in them. Oh. Um, military vehicle, I know we've been over this, but um, the county got the surplus, uh, you know, mine resistant vehicle. You think it's a good idea? He thinks it's a bad idea because it can tip over and it's really hard to travel. And I don't know, have you ever been in it? And do you think it's good to have, uh, despite the fact that it was kind of made for a desert, apparently? Sure. Well, first of all, I want to say I'm a very pro community policing type officer. Uh, my background has been in community policing. I was in charge of our crime prevention for three years. Prior to that, I was a, uh, a crime prevention officer. So I believe in community policing. We have a responsibility to the citizens of the same county to keep them safe, but we also have a re responsibility to our deputies to keep them safe if they're going into a, a very dangerous situation. Uh, the fact is, is the vehicle's here. It's, it ain't, it's not costing the sheriff's office anything. Uh, it's already been used once in a armed barricaded subject situation that was ended peacefully and without any shots fired, anybody getting hurt. Uh, most people in Salmon County, most residents of Salmon County will probably never even see this vehicle, but I, I do believe it's a good idea to have a vehicle, and this just replaces an armed vehicle that we already had, but I do believe it's a, a good idea to have a vehicle in our fleet that is available for those type of emergency situations. How do you train people to operate that? Uh, we, I, my understanding is we have an agreement with the National Guard and to help provide those services. And we have people that have prior military service that are capable of driving them right now. Uh, uh, for the part of rolling over, you know, this is not a desert situation. It's most of it's uh, on roadways. So I, I don't see that uh, being an issue. But there's gasoline involved. So there is a cost involved in that. Well, right? any piece of equipment, there's, right. Right, any piece of equipment, there's going to be some cost, but this is very minimal. Uh, whether it's that vehicle or another armored vehicle, you still have to pay for gas, but it's not costing the sheriff's office anything other than that. What about the message that that sends? What message does that send to the community that you feel you need to have? <laughs> well, I think I think it yeah I think it depends what you're I think it depends what you're using it for, you know. Well, I guess we can second guess it. I don't know. Uh, the fact is, is it doesn't matter if it's a, tra a trailer park or a community. Uh, it was an armed barricaded subject, and we had to resolve the issue, uh, the, and it worked. Uh, so, you know, I think it depends on how it's used. Uh, I don't think most people will ever see it. Uh, it's only going to be used in extreme situations.
there have been armed barricades and subjects all over for years that have been dealt with in a peaceful manner. Um, well, my understanding, they had another situation uh, in Southern View last year where an, an individual was armed inside their house, and they used an armored vehicle uh, and had a ram on it and went up and rammed the door, and that ended peacefully as well. It well, kind of <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, well, well, you know that that's property that, that's property that can be fixed. You know, the fact is, no shots were fired, nobody was hurt, the the individual was taken into custody. Right. Um, diversity in in the department, uh, deputies and jailers, does it re reflect the community enough, racially or with gender? Uh, and if so, what's your view on? if it's okay or where it should go and how? Well, I think we can always try to work harder and do a better job. Uh, you know, uh, re recruiting, minority recruiting is a community effort. It's not just a law enforcement effort. What we need to find out, and I did some research on this after the, the primary, that question came up, and a lot of us said, we need to find out why minorities are not applying for jobs, whether it's uh, race or gender, or why, why qualified, and, minorities not applying for the job and try to address those issues. And we need to address those issues as a community. So I think we can always do a better job. Uh, my uh, direction is going to be to continue to work hard in that area. Uh, we currently have five females on the department. Uh, out of the five, one's a captain, uh, two are in the detective bureau, one's a canine handler, and one has less year on the job. So, you know, the, the females that do come in the department have a fair opportunity to be considered for other positions and and for upward mobility. Do you know what the minority percentage is? I do not know that breakdown. Um, and can we also talk about, uh, I know that you differ from Mr. Reagan on um, requirements to get in. I know he wants a college degree, which Neil Williamson has put in to just apply to be a deputy uh, for your degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and you say you don't have to have or your degree if you have is it four years of um, military active duty or why don't you explain yeah. where you are and how that differs and why it's good sure the current system right now is if you have two years active duty military you're still required to have a minimum of 60 hours of college so it's two plus two so it's kind of like four right total. okay uh, my position is is these individuals learned a lot of the skills and training that's necessary for law enforcement and if they have went out and served their country for four, six, eight years, and they come on back and they want to conserve their community, I think they should have the opportunity to test and be considered uh, for employment without the college requirement. We're not the only agency that does this. Uh, Springfield Police does not require any college at this point in time. And state police, if you've served in a combat zone uh, or have a combat ribbon since 1991, the college requirement is waived as well. Uh, I just think it, it, these individuals, they have served their country. Uh, if they've been in the military that long and they've had a received an honorable discharge, then they should be considered for employment. And I'm not talking about military preferences. I'm not talking about giving them more points or an, any advantage. I'm just saying they shouldn't be at a disadvantage when they come back and they want to serve their community. Okay. But you don't, you don't require the combat zone in your like two years. Is there, is it a I do not. Minimum? Is, or is there any minimum of the amount of service? Is it two years that would be a minimum of uh, in, being in? to qualify sure. just to at least test most most, most of your military contracts for active duty is four years four six or eight years okay i mean are you requiring at least four years in your if you would set this as a policy i would look at that but i would my my proposal is, is if they've served active duty in the military which means they've served more than 180 days in an active duty status uh and they have an honorable discharge mm -hmm. then they can be considered okay and i know Regan, for example, said he still wants to stay with the college requirement. Sure. He says sometimes what you learn in the military is not necessarily the what you need on the street to deal with all these different kinds of people and, you know, but, a little more touchy-feely yeah. stuff. Uh, in my position, we're going to teach them that at the police academy, and they're, they serve a year on probation in the department. Uh, we have numerous police officers that serve our community right now that are at, even active military reservists. Uh, we have someone on the sheriff's office. They, make, they can make very good police officers. Uh, not everybody that attends college is going to make a great police officer, but not everybody in the military is going to make a great police officer either. You look at the individual, and I think they should have the same opportunities. Can we talk for a minute about corrections? Sure. Uh, you have two facilities, the jail for adults and the jail for juveniles. 
Uh, the sheriff's office does not handle the juvenile side of the uh, the, the jail, or the uh, their. No, it's the Salmon County Juvenile uh, Probation Division. And is that under the state? Then? No, it's under the sheriff. It's under the county government, but it's not under the sheriff's office. I see. But you make those arrests. Correct. Okay. And not just the sheriff's office, but all police officers in Salmon County. Right. So let's first talk about the juvenile population. Do you have an mm -hmm. idea what that's like? Uh, you don't run it, I realize. Well, I was at the a meeting that yesterday, and I believe they have 19 individuals. Uh, over there right now, majority of them are in the 16 to 17 year age range. Uh, the law changed a couple years ago that made it if they, the law used to be if you was uh, over 17, you could be considered an adult and you went to the county jail. Well, now the law says if you're 17 but under 18, you're still considered a juvenile and you go to juvenile uh, facilities. So it's increased their uh, population over there, is my understanding. It fluctuates. Uh, it's, it's lower in the winters. Uh, the last winter, we were around the 280, 290 uh, population, average population daily. The jail is equipped to have a house 314. Uh, right now, the last couple months, the summer months, it's been averaging around 330. Oh, so you're over capacity. Correct. You're no longer taking, or they're no longer taking inmates from other counties or the feds, or are they? Yeah. Uh, I, I do not know the answer. I believe they store from the feds, but I do, I, I'm not positive on that. What's the demographic of that population? Do you know what the breakdown is between, for example, whites and blacks? I do not. What's your visual observation? Uh, I haven't been employed there for a year and a half, so I haven't been in the jail for a year and a half, so I, don't, I have not observed it. Okay. Do you know the reasons why most people are sent to that facility? Because uh, they commit the crimes. Reasons? Pardon me? What, do you know what the top three reasons? Well, they're, they can only go there for one reason. That's when they commit a crime, and they're arrested. I realize that I'm asking for the top three crimes. Is there any? Oh, the top three crimes. Data that shows what, what, the what people come for, and is there any distinction between whites and blacks? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and very time consuming for somebody to get uh, a paramedic license. And then you got your annual, tra annual training to keep it up. Uh, and then they actually have to go to the hospital and do uh, hours at the hospital uh, with the, under the supervision of a doctor or nurse. And so it's very costly. I think this, the current position, the system we have as well. I do believe we can do a better job on the mental health training. And I've said that from the beginning. I said that in the primary. Uh, I was shocked to find out that the mental health training for corrections was watching an hour DVD and answering a, a 10 question uh, uh, test. Uh, I believe that we should have trained mental health professionals in there that the, the officers can interact with. They can ask questions, ask about scenarios or situations they ran into. You mean like occasional courses with it? You're not talking about a full time person? No, not a full time person. I'm talking about annual training. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the fact is, is the, in jails, and it's not just the same kind of jail, uh, there's a large population of people that have mental health issues. And we're trying to work through those issues. Uh, I know uh, they're talking about starting the, and they're in the process of, of starting the mental health court, very similar to the, the drug court. And I think that could be very important. A lot, unfortunately, a lot of times when mental health pay, uh, inmates are released, they have nowhere to go. Uh, and so they'll go out and they commit another crime and get locked up again. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, an issue that we have to deal with. We need to continue to look for solutions. But I know the, the mental health court might be able to help in that area because they can require them to do certain things that are not, is not done right now. Uh, so I, I support that effort. get back for a minute kind of as a follow-up to Joan's earlier question about the, the jail would it be fair to say that half of the people are awaiting trial and then the other half or the remainder are sentenced to something less or than a year wouldn't make bail. Yeah. right or, or those that have been sentenced but it's less than a year so they don't go to the Department of Corrections right. I don't I don't have that breakdown I it, I, if I was going to give out those type of numbers, I'd, well, I'd want to be accurate. Yeah, I mean, I just, yeah. And then, is there kind of different programming available for people that have been actually sentenced other than those awaiting trial? I mean, are there? I think all services available to all inmates, whether they're awaiting trial or they're serving their time. Okay. I hate to keep King on campaign issues, but it's a campaign. And, uh, <laughs> Your opponent said he wants to take four detectives and take them off, like, I guess, regular day shift, put them uh, on patrol so they would be closer to the action, get there sooner, and wanted your reaction to his idea on that. I know he talked about a million dollars in savings, and he revised that, although it's still a million-dollar right. dollar figure as of this morning. Right. Uh, but he said it would save some money on overtime, and it would, he, when he was here, he talked about, um, you know, getting to the scene quicker so you don't have to recreate things the next day and, you know, just have your deputies trying to save the evidence, you can do it as the de detective on scene. Sure. Uh, right now, well, as you point out, there's no way you can reduce a million dollars from the overtime budget because the budget's just a little over a million dollars. And there's con uh, contractual uh, obligations we have to pay for holidays and stuff like that. Uh, rarely is a detective called out to process a crime scene after hours anyway. Uh, we have crime scene detective or crime scene technicians on each shift that can process a scene. And the deputies, that's what they're trained to do, is do the initial investigation, follow the leads as, as they can follow them, write the report, and forward it to the uh, detective bureau. Okay, so it, a, a crime scene technician is different than a deputy? They it's a deputy, but added training. Oh, so added so training. So they come over. There's one on every shift. Right. So there's, a big there's a couple on every shift. So okay. when days off, uh, they're on their days off, we have other ones there. Okay. Uh, rarely do is there a time when we don't have a crime scene technician on shift. Okay. Uh, so then... If a detective is, uh, well, let me say back in 2008, 2009, we had 16 detectives in the sheriff's office. Uh, because of budget cuts, uh, that at the high we had 76 deputies, now we're down to 63. Uh, there's currently 10 detectives. So if you take four of those and move them on the, out on the street, when they may or may not even have a call, or a crime scene to respond to or process, I think is a waste of manpower. Uh, in addition, I don't think the contract would allow you to say you're going to go here for four hours and you're going to go here for four hours. And in fact, detectives attend more court more often than deputies. So then you're going to have the overcost of they're going to have to come in during the day 
to go to attend court. Uh, so the cost is going to be there somewhere. Uh, the fact is that's why we have crime scene technicians on each shift, so we don't have to call any detective to process it. They're trained for that. And the deputies, I mean, that's the police job is to do the initial investigation. And just his other point is he said he would hire a woman to interview victims of child or domestic abuse. Uh, and I know when I talked to Neil Williamson, apparently there are two, is it two women deputies on the force now? Or is it? Well, there's two detectives. Two detectives, yes. okay. So, I mean, is, is what Mr. Regan talking about necessary uh, to have another woman on the force to be trained in this kind of interviewing, or is it adequately handled now, and are men and women equal at doing that? Well, I think it's adequate the way it is now. Uh, we have a very good system in place. Uh, there's an agency called the Child Advocacy Center, which I do have brochures on it that we won't have to pass out. It's right next to the county building. Uh, when a call comes in for a ch sexual abuse of a child, uh, the responding deputy takes the initial report. We never interviewed the child. We take the information from the, the call giver, uh, whether it be a parent, guardian, teacher, uh, counselor, whoever it may be. We take their information, what the child said, we contact the Child Advocacy Center, they contact the detective that's responsible for that jurisdiction. Uh, so if it's Salmon County, they'll call the Salmon County detective that's, because we're, we have team members assigned to okay, help so with those type of cases. So they getting a detective involved from, uh, from the department? Absolutely. Okay. And whatever agency is responsible, they'll, they'll call that, the agent, mm -hmm. that detective that's on call for their, uh, for their teams. And so the detective makes a decision, are we going to come out right now? Can, is the child in danger? Is he still with the offender? And then if not, and all those questions are answered, then they will bring him to the Child Advocacy Center the next day or the follow business day to conduct the interview. And that's very important because the interview is done by a forensic investigator or a forensic interviewer. And so it helps with less traumatization of the child. And also it helps with the investigation because the child is in one room being interviewed and you have the law enforcement agency in another room, along with uh, a representative from the, the DCFS and a representative of the state attorney's office. So who's the, the forensic interviewer is with what agency? Is that a person? The, that's is that a, your own detective? No, or is that with child advocacy that's Child Advocacy Center. Center. Okay, so they're the ones that are doing the basic And interview. it's been done this way for, right, for 25 years. Okay. And what helps with that is the child only has to tell the story once. And it's done by a very highly trained individual to know how to get those questions and answer, or answer, ask those questions and get the answers. And with the police and the state attorney's office and DCFS in the other room, they can submit questions to the interviewer. It's like, can we? Can you ask about this? Do they watch through a window or something? Yes. So they watch the window. They have uh, are able to communicate with the uh, interviewer, and so they can submit questions. So as they get all the answers they need, hopefully, right there at that very first interview, and they don't have to interview the child again. They also help with the follow up of medical service, mental health services that they provide to the victims and to the family. Uh, so it, it's a great organization, it's, like I said, it's been there, and it's, it's helped on the investigation of child sexual abuse, and it's also helped uh, with the prosecution. So the detective that's called from you guys, you're saying they don't even, do they even have contact with the child much at all? Uh, they have, I don't believe they have contact with the child, they have contact with the uh, People that have the information other than the child. Like a, like a parent if they need, if they need more, if they need more information from the child, they would bring it back to the child advocacy center and have the interviewer uh, do a follow-up investigation. But okay. my so understanding is normally it, they're done in one, they're done in one interview. Okay. So you think Mr. Regan's idea is just not required because you've got that system? I'm not sure he knows about that system. So no, I don't believe it's required. Um, and, and you know, they do a great job, and the the state attorney's office is happy with it because. That it's increased the uh, prosecution where these offenders are taken off the street. And as the, the domestic violence part of it, every deputy is trained to how to give people advice and, and, and give them direction on how not to be victims of domestic violence in the first place. Uh, we refer them to agencies like Soldier Center, uh, Catholic Charities, social service agencies that they can contact if they're involved in a domestic situation. For you think a woman would be appropriate yeah. yeah, I think uh, he might have been, that might have been part of what he was talking right. about, too. I wondered if that's yeah, I think it was. Uh, Again, I think we work with the, I uh, uh, can't think of the name of the agency that deals with sexual assault of women. Sojourn? Uh, uh, what, uh, yeah, they changed names. I can't remember the, the, the current name. Sexual assault. Yeah, I, I think we work with them. Uh, not every person wants to talk to a female detective. Uh, they may want to talk to a male detective. Uh, 
and an example of what gives me is a young child that is sexually assaulted by a male may not feel comfortable talking to another male. And, it, and that could be the same thing with a, an adult male. Uh, they don't want to talk to another male about it because of the you know, conflict. So all deputies are trained in, in, in interviews, but that's, those type of interviews would be done by the detective bureau anyway. And they're, we should assign the best person possible to the case, no matter if it's a male or a female. Uh, the best person that can handle the case that can investigate it. Does somebody request a woman or man? Would you be able to accommodate? Does that happen? Does uh, something happen to you? Yes. Yeah. Talk to Absolutely, it, hap it happens, and we and we do that. Okay. As the sheriff, how would you ensure that the officers under your purview live up to the highest standards of policing, integrity, honesty, treatment of people, etc.? Those are very high priorities on, on the way I think the department should be ran. Okay. And it, com it, it comes down to training, environment, enforcement of policy procedure, make sure you got the policy procedure in, in place for that, and your hiring selection. You know, I, that's one of the things I want to look at when we're hiring is does the person have integrity? Uh, can they make a decision? Are they, do they have common sense? You know, do they know how to interact with people? And you can learn that in the first year if you, know, if you don't get it out of the interview and in the hiring process, you can get that out of the first year. Uh, the FTOs are going to be monitoring how they're interacting with the citizens. Uh, so those are very high priority. I think everybody, no matter what side of town you live on, should be treated with respect, treated like it was your mother, your father, your sister that you were dealing with or want them to be dealt with, and, and do the right thing. Um, the, the sheriff, Neil Williamson, has tried to get some extra money for Police. I think it's is it a quarter cent sales tax that he wanted. Uh, any thoughts on that? Any need at this time? You know, I, I do not believe in raising taxes. Uh, would we like to have more money? Absolutely, we would. Uh, but so would the uh, public works, and so would county highways, and so you know we can't continue taxing people to to uh, get our wish list. Uh, you know, we have to operate within the budget we're given uh, as the economy. Uh, continues to get better. I'm sure the, the county board, the county board's very concerned about law enforcement as well. You know, the, it was not easy for them to have us make these cuts. But I think most people can agree county government is in a much better position than most other governments because they make the tough decisions and they make the department heads live with those decisions. And as I've been told, as the revenue increases, our budget will increase so we can continue adding more manpower. But we're meeting the needs of the people right now. You know, unfortunately, we don't have a crime prevention, crime prevention division, which that's my goal to bring back when we have the personnel to do it. Uh, but we do have people on the street that are responding for the calls of service. And we have, uh, even though it's a minimum number of investigators, we have investigators to invest those, investigate crimes. So Go ahead. I'm usually accustomed to just jumping in, but I'm trying to behave today. <laughs> um, back to the selection process. I know you're a former Marine. And that would give you some natural predilection to look for people with military background. I've talked to people in police command uh, who talk about maybe the military person who's a candidate isn't automatically good for that just because they have a military background. Mm -hmm. Because in the military, you're taught to follow really rigid discipline. Some of that's just life-saving, but uh, not like an officer who after a year or two is out there by him or herself and judgment becomes an issue as opposed to there's just a rigid rule to follow or some uh, line of order to follow and they have to make a judgment. Uh, what's your opinion about that? Well, that's what I said earlier. Not every person that has served in the military is make a good police officer. Uh, but not every person that goes to college can make a good police officer. I do believe, and it's been my experience, uh, that people that have served in the military can make very good police officers. Uh, in fact, as I said earlier, we there's numerous police officers that serve our community right now that serve in the, act, or serve in the, in the Guard uh, and have prior military experience and they, and they make great police officers. I'm not, I've not said and I'm not saying that they're everybody I hire is going to have a military background. My only thing is I think they should be able to apply and be considered for employment just like any other person. And then we'll look at those other aspects of whether they're going to make a good police officer or not. And we're going to teach them everything they need to know about police work in the, in the academy. And then we've got that year of probation that if 
they're not working out, then they can be dismissed without without cause. So 12 months probation? Yes. Okay. Um, I've heard your and saying, you know, you're the one that's worked in the sheriff's department. Mm -hmm. uh, then Regan, of course, talks about he's, you know, getting his doctorate and he's got all this advanced education and he's been with the state police and in Afghanistan, et cetera. And I know you've been overseas as well. You were overseas too, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so what, and maybe because you didn't do an introduction because we started quickly, uh, what, what makes you better than him? You know, he's talking education and maybe an outside look to improve things and you're talking inside knowledge. So which is better? Why are you the best guy? Well, no, I've said both actually. I've said that my inside knowledge gives me a, uh, makes me a better candidate, but I'm also running because I think it needs, it needs a new fresh look. And I said that in the primary. I think it's important that uh, there's a change of leadership every once in a while to bring in new vision, new leadership, uh, new ideas to, and I equated it in the primary is like when you move to a different town. Uh, you know, your first year, you're trying to find the best store to shop, the best uh, places to eat, the best place to buy gas. And once you're there for a while, you continue going back to those same locations normally, typically. Uh, same thing when a new leader comes in. We have the opportunity to look at everything again. And are we getting the best services? Do we have the best uh, contract uh, people that are providing the services? Can we do a better job? So I, I, I've said that uh, all along. The fact is I do have some college, as I had mentioned to you. I attended some college courses when I was in the military. Uh, when I got out, I was very fortunate. I got, I got out in January, and I was hired uh, as a, with the sheriff's office in April. So I was out for three months. And my goal was to be in law enforcement. My goal was to be a police officer. That's why I went in the military in the first place. And my training and my experience comes from the 20 and a half years of law enforcement right here in Salmon County, uh, and 25 of those years with the sheriff's office, and 12 of those years in a management position uh, as a shift commander. So I believe that I have the skills, and not only in the sheriff's office, but my community's uh, relations. I've uh, been involved in the community for a number of years, uh, have s numerous community contacts, that we can reach out to and, and be involved. And so I, you know, I think with my community background and my law enforcement background, I'm the best choice. Can, can, you, address, and we're almost finished, <laughs> can you address this issue with the debate and what is happening with that? The respondent says that you won't debate. What is happening? What is, are well, you willing to debate? Or? In fact, we just scheduled yesterday, we're going to be doing a, a joint appearance on Jim Leach's show okay. on October 31st. Uh, the fact is, the, the other uh, debate form they were trying to put together, we couldn't agree on a date. Uh, we submitted uh, two other dates that was going to be uh, more available on our calendar. We already had something scheduled on the first date they wanted to do it. And then our opponent tr sent out a press release and attacked us and saying we we're trying to avoid. And, you know, I ran a very good clean campaign for 16 months. I'm not going to make it or let it get negative at this point. Uh, we felt that it was trying to be turned into a negative turn and we decided we didn't want to deal with that. We weren't going to participate in it. Wouldn't it have also served your purpose though to say, yeah, I'll, I'll do it anyway even though you're being a jerk about it? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, again, we thought it was best for us to avoid th that type of situation in the first place and continue to what, we, what we've been doing for the last 16 months. Uh, you know, we've been out uh, for 16 months telling what my goals and my objectives are for the Sheriff's Office and, and we felt that it was best interest that we just okay. declined that. What time is the leech thing? Is that eight in the morning or? Uh, seven. Seven, 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 is seven, seven, eight, yes. seven eight. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. early on Halloween day. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, what can you just explain? And this is just because I don't, I don't know. Um, the jurisdiction, uh, city, county. So, mm. what do you respond to everything that the city does, or does the City ever get outside the city limits, or sure. how's, how's that work? Uh, no, we do not respond to everything the city does, and the city don't respond to everything we do. The, can we? Yes. Can they? Yes. Uh, we have an intergovernmental agreement with all agencies in Salmon County, uh, and there's a concept out there in the intergovernmental agreement called the closest car concept. So if it's a crime in progress or a major crime, it goes out with a radio, and any car in the area can go. Uh, Basically, the work with Grandview and Southern View. And all agencies in Salmon Park County. Incorporated. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, all agencies in Salmon County. So, Grandview, their normal uh, responsibility and jurisdictions in the city limits of Grandview, same with Springfield Police. The county, we have jurisdiction anywhere anywhere in the county. State police has jurisdiction anywhere in the state. So, but again, if we need help, they can respond and they can act and take take care of the situation. 
but until we get there. So you could respond to an issue on the interstate? Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much for being with us today. Well, thank you. And, uh, is there anything that we didn't touch on that you had wanted to bring up? Or uh, you know, I think we, t we touched on, on most of it. And uh, I just want to say it's an honor and it's a pleasure uh, to be here again today. And I think it's important that the citizens be able to see both candidates and try to make the best choice possible. And I believe I'm the best choice. Again, you know, my 28 years, 20 and a half years of law enforcement, it's all been right here in Salmon County and 25 with the Sheriff's Office. And uh, I know the Sheriff's Office. I believe I know the community, and I believe the community knows me, and I, I believe I'm the best choice.